Uh, can you tell us a bit about your forthcoming book? Well, it's actually a story of my 44-year search for the thylacine. And it starts in 1967 and continues almost through to the present. And in it I detail the ups and downs and uh, trials and tribulations along the way. Um, and uh, some of my expeditions. And generally it's, it's a, a biography of my search for the, for the tiger. And can you tell us about your own encounters with the tiger? Well, I don't want to speculate too much on this at the moment, but uh, I um, I seen a, actually seen a, a live breathing tiger in the World Valley in 1995, and the book sent us around that. And um, I don't want to say a lot more than that. <laughs> you have to read the book. <laughs> Absolutely. And um, you think you you may have had a, an earlier sighting. Yeah, well, I believe I seen one in '67, um, and that started me off. It was on the Coorong in South Australia. To this day, I'm not sure that it was a Tasmanian tiger, but it was certainly something very strange. And a lot of people were seeing similar sort of animals around there in those days. And I naturally, um, I looked into it and uh, did a bit of research, and that's the best animal I could come up with—the animal I seen. So that started me off anyway, and got me interested in the scaper and. And one thing grew to another, and uh, it became an obsession. <laughs> now, you were telling me earlier about some of your expeditions, and it doesn't sound like uh, an expedition into the Tasmanian wilderness is for the faint-hearted. No, it's something that people enter into uh, not knowing what they're going to come up against. And it's another world, it really is, and uh, not for the faint-hearted. And many try and many come to grief. And um, it's something you've got to sit down and really work out and plan and get right. Otherwise, you can go very, very wrong. And some of the places that I've been into, I wouldn't advise anyone to go into. Um, not alone, as I did. You've got to be crazy to go in alone. And having said that, I must be crazy. Because that's <laughs> the way I worked on my own. And uh, But that's the way it's got to be done. Because this is one special animal. And um, you've got to go in with... Uh, uh, minimum fuss, noise, no scent, no odours. You've got to smell like a gum tree. <laughs> There's a lot of things come into it and it's not a, just a matter of saying we're going to go and hunt tigers, let's go, because uh, it's not the way to do it. If you've got any chance at all, you've got to play everything right. This is one special animal. So does it give you some hope for its continued survival that there are these impenetrable pockets of Tasmania? Yeah, it's the only hope the tiger's got is to retreat into these these uh, out-of-the-way places. And that's what it's done. And that's why a lot aren't being seen today because they're off the beaten track and well away from where people normally go. But these are the only areas that you can expect to see a tiger in today, the pure wilderness areas. Can you tell us um, about some of the sightings, some contemporary sightings that you found really compelling, like why you found them really compelling? Well, I just returned from West Coast Expedition uh, in 2005 and I got a phone call shortly after I arrived home and one was seen crossing the uh, West Coast Road uh, between Dermot Bridge and Queenstown and that was an excellent sighting and one of the best I've ever had and that spurred me on to go down into that Jane River country to search for the animal down there and uh, I can tell you that uh, it's rough and it's tough and it's, it's not uh, very hospitable at all, but it's this, the area you've got to go into to find it. So you're not seeing as many sightings today as they were, say, even 10 years ago. But the, sight, the few sightings that do come through are usually quality and worth looking into. Do you think we will actually come um, to some sort of definitive position on the thylacine sometime in the next 20 years, or, or is it too late for that? No, it worries me just which way this is going to go because the animal is critically endangered. There's, there's not many there. Let's face it, there's only a handful. And uh, the scientists tell us that it couldn't possibly be because it would breed itself out. But this animal can inbreed with no ill uh, consequences. So the animal is there in very, very scant numbers. And the way we handle it when it is proven to be there is all important. And, um, and that's the crunch question just how are we going to handle it? Because the, the animal that I've seen, all the planning that I'd 
put in my brain and driven into myself for so many years all went out the door and I was in such shock that I didn't know how to handle it and this is going to be the problem when it is eventually proven to be there and it will be but it depends who finds it and where they find it that's the important question. You were telling me earlier some stories about um, your associations with uh, Dr Eric Geiler. Um, would he, in your opinion, be perhaps the, you know, the most, or was the most foremost authority on the thylacine? Oh, Eric was without a doubt the world authority on it. And we sat down on a, a stump one day out in the bush and uh, talked about how we'd handle it when we, if we come across it. And Eric had his ideas and I had mine, but on most points we could agree. Uh, but we did agree that the way it was handled was all important and where the animal was going to be kept, whether it was going to be left where it was or put on a secure island like Marara Island and uh, in a semi-captive breeding population and monitored by satellite navigation. All these things come into it. So it's not a clear-cut question that we find the tiger and then we breed from it. There's a whole lot of things that have got to come into it before ever that starts. And the important thing is that the government, Australian, the federal or state governments, competent enough to handle the situation when it arises. That's what worries me. Mm. And a lot of people have searched for the thylacine over the years, um, including people like, you know, Ned Terry, yourself. Mm. What is it that actually drives you on? It's a hard question. <laughs> it's the love of the animal. Um, to, to see it through to, uh, to fulfilment. Um, before, when the animal died out, hardly anything was known about it. No scientific study much had been done on it at all. they have never been bred in captivity that we know of. And all these things have got to be faced. And just how we're going to handle it and what's going to happen to the animal uh, is a bit of a concern. But if it's handled properly, I'm sure that uh, it will work out well in the end. But a lot of people say it'd be a big tourism dollar. But then tourism is not the only uh, consolation here. Uh, the animal itself must be of prime importance how it's handled and, and looked after. So, you know, um, having said that, um, nothing's clear cut. We don't really know what's going to happen. And as far as experts go, there are no experts on this animal. They all died out many, many years ago when the last of the trappers and bushmen died out. So how are we going to handle it? I don't know. I don't really know. But it is important that we do it the right way. Mm. And um, is, is, is there any chance you'll be hanging up your thylacine research hat in the future or do you think this is something that you'll be... Well, I don't really want to. It's a bit like driving a car. You don't really want to do, do it, uh, give it up until the crunch comes and uh, you've got to. So I'm afraid that's a bit like this. My heart will still be in it. Uh, maybe well, my legs won't carry me as well, but uh, I'll still be trying. <laughs> And a few years ago they were trying to clone um, a thylacine. Mm. What, what did you think about that? Oh, it's a long shot. Yeah? <laughs> it's not going to happen too quickly. But then as I said to Mike Archer, who was in charge of the project, why, why, why clone it when it's still here? Mm. Thank you.